A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, a convicted felon who had changed his life around and was advocating for reform and was also helping young people in trouble finds himself in trouble. He's been charged with killing a man and chopping up his body. So much for reform. But first, a children's sleepover takes a terrifying turn when the hosting father allegedly put sedatives in the girls' smoothies. One of the girls who drank just a little bit was able to stay awake long enough to text for help. And when the parents showed up to pick up their girls in the middle of the night, that father tried to talk them out of it, said they should stay until the morning. The girls were so out of it that they needed help walking. We are recording this on Wednesday, March 13th of 2024, and our guest today is Dr. Judy Ho, a clinical and forensic neuropsychologist, author, a dear friend of the show, um, a friend on Instagram who can get us through the day when we can't figure our ways out of a box. (laughs) Judy's always got some suggestions. Welcome back, Judy. Oh, thank you so much, Anna. And it's always awesome to be with you. I know that we talk about such challenging cases, but... We got to try to get each other through it, you know, and totally can't lose that empathy and that compassion. I think that sometimes you hear these cases and you it's almost like you're you're almost overwhelmed. Like we are. We're constantly overwhelmed. And as I always say that what we're talking about here is human behavior. Yes. These are choices that people make that are criminal. But I mean, when we look at the thought process, it's like, really, if you are faced with the same challenges, is that what you would do? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I do want to take a moment I know, um, to just to let everyone know that we got this great little recognition. We won an <gasps> award here for the podcast. Yay! It's very exciting. We won the um, 65th annual Southern California Journalism Awards. And uh, this is presented by the LA Press Club for best podcast. And we just want to thank the LA Press Club and all of you for um, supporting us. So I wanted to make that mention. We've been very oh. remiss in um, letting everyone know this will be going back there with all the trophies in the back. We're very excited. Thank you to the entire team. Congratulations, Anna. You guys deserve it. Thank you to everyone, the team. This is all of you wonderful people who join us every week to figure this out and the team behind the scenes. And then Will, the only other person from the team you get to see. We're a very tiny team. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, I just wanted to start off on a positive note because we're about to go down a rabbit hole into sadness and um, really scary stuff. Uh, we as parents, you know, when when we think of every parent's worst nightmare, this first case falls under that banner. And there's so many things that are a parent's worst nightmare. But this is when something terrible happens to your child while on a sleepover. That's what this case is about. And it happened in Lake Oswego, Oregon. And it involves three girls who were sleeping over at their friend's house, all three girls, 12 years old. 12 years old, given sedatives, say police, in their little smoothies at night by the dad in charge. Oh, Judy, this really upsets me. You know, what's sick about it is that this is your friend's parent right and just this idea of hey this is supposed to be some wholesome sleepover a good time don't worry it's parent supervised and then taking advantage of that moment when these girls are obviously off guard and just trying to have a nice time it is a very scary thing i remember when my son started to get old enough to do sleepovers and i was beside myself you know my mother wouldn't let me do sleepovers um that was absolutely like my mother was you know, very conservative and just very overprotective. And so I never got a chance to do um, sleepovers when I was a kid. And when we've talked about cases like this in the past, some of you have actually made comments on YouTube saying, and that is why my children are not permitted to do sleepovers. I'll be very curious to hear from all of you what your opinions are and your parenting style and what you do in a situation like this. Like, how do you protect yourself? Right. 
I mean, it's so terrible. And I, I totally understand the range of reactions that people would have. I never actually had sleepovers when I was younger. My parents didn't allow it. So obviously everybody has different parenting decisions about sleepovers and there's no right or wrong decision. You just have to try your best as we often do as parents to try to make the best decision in the moment. But I'm think, curious, Judy, I'm yeah. curious. Mm -hmm. So your parents didn't allow sleepovers. My mother didn't. No. And I, I, my personal opinion about that is, you know, we were immigrants and my mother was mm -hmm. extremely conservative and very fearful of many things. Um, you know, you, and I'm just curious why your parents didn't allow sleepovers. Yes, yeah, so we are all immigrants as well. I'm an immigrant myself. I moved here from Taiwan when I was nine years old with my parents and my younger sister who was around five at the time. And I do think that some of it is the parenting styles of traditional Chinese culture. My parents yeah. also being on the stricter side, not fully trusting the community because we just were getting to know the community, for example. And I remember getting into arguments with my parents that, you know, well, I, my friends have so much more leeway. They get to stay out late. They get to uh, have sleepovers. Um, but I think that that was their re reason behind it is just, well, we don't know these parents. So right. we don't really trust that they're gonna take the kind of care of you that we feel like we would. Um, so my parents always made me, you know, some concessions. They said, hey, look, we won't let you have sleepovers, but if you want to have anyone come and sleep over here, we're okay with that, right? So it's a little bit of a bargaining thing where, you know, as a parent, maybe you're trying to make that best decision and saying, well, I can't give you this, but can I give you this other thing instead? And I will say, and maybe it's of course, because of what we do, Anna, that now that I'm hearing all these stories, I'm kind of glad that my parents didn't let me sleep over. Yeah. Um, I also know that we're exposed to it so much more than the average person. And it's not that you shouldn't ever let your child sleep over, but you really need to get to know the parents. You need to be able to have a way to check in with them. You should be setting up maybe check-in times and points throughout the evening so that if you don't hear from your child by that time, you're just driving over to that house. You know what I mean? So yeah. maybe there just needs to be more structure and protection around those times. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. It's just so interesting because I, I don't meet a lot of people who weren't allowed to have sleepovers e either. So yeah. I'm so curious when you said that. All right. Let's yep. get into this case and the details of it and how pivotal it was that one young girl, one of the 12 year olds who who was suspicious and didn't like the drink and stayed awake was the one who called for help. So thank goodness for this little girl being so alert. And and had she not done this, I don't even want to think of what would have happened. So the accused mm -hmm. here is 57 year old Michael Maiden, and he is the father of the little girl who invited three of her friends over for the sleepover. He was the supervising dad. Now, according to his since deleted LinkedIn profile, Michael graduated from Arizona State University and he had a career in human resources management. And he and his wife used to live in this house, a $1.3 million house. Um, but according to published reports, they have since split. So it's unclear whether they were going through the divorce at the time or not, but the mother for sure was not in the house. So it was just the dad. And you know, for families that are either blended or separated or divorced or all these, you know, different configurations that we have of families now, sometimes there is just a dad and the moms are dealing with the dads and the dads, you know, it's just, Everything is a little bit different now, um, so it wouldn't be unusual, especially if the father has a girl, to maybe have a sleepover. But I could see where there would be some hesitation, some hesitation, understandable, they're, they're young. Now, what's interesting is that, so this incident happened back in August, August 25th of 2023, but we're not learning about it until now because it wasn't until the beginning of 2024 that a grand jury indicted. And so he's turned himself in and now this case has become public. Okay, now, according to the parents of the girls, none of the parents apparently knew the dad all that well. If that's so, it really troubles me. It's, you know, but that happens a lot, right? Your kids can be, Judy, your kids can be best friends, but because of scheduling, you may not really know the parent that well. Right. Yeah, I think that that happens all the time. And, you know, I, I think that there obviously is a comfort by association. You know, you look at the child, this 12 year old daughter, and you think, hey, she's a good kid. So she must come from a good family, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong as a with, with a parent who assumes that, 
because yeah. you, you look at this child, you're like, hey, you know what? This child is a, a good girl. She's going to school. She's getting good grades. She's not using drugs or alcohol. She's from a good family. Why wouldn't a parent think that, right? Mm -hmm. It makes sense. And it's just when things get busy, maybe you don't have time to have scheduled sit downs with everyone, right? And so you're thinking, hey, you know what? Everything's probably okay. I also think that when there are multiple kids as opposed to just one child sleeping over, you're like, well, okay, so, so there's three girls going over. Right. So they'll be safe altogether. So the girls told police that Michael, this is the dad, was very involved in the girls' activities. Now, there's two ways to look at this. He's either trying to make sure they have the time of their life or there's a little weirdness going on here. So he got them to get their nails done. He um, picked up their favorite pizza. He made sure that they had plenty of beauty products so they could give themselves little facials. They were with all the kids were staying in the basement. Sounds like a very typical, typical sleepover. However, he then set up the sprinklers so they could run through the sprinklers. Okay, that sounds like very innocent child stuff. Then they jumped in the hot tub. Kids do love hot tubs. Kids do love hot tubs. But you know, this this only sounds extremely disturbing when we discuss the rest yeah. of this, right? When you put it right. into context, you all of you listening are starting to cringe with, with me and with Judy. Cringing. Okay, so for the most part, the girls were in the basement and Michael apparently, this is from the description of the girls, came down a lot to check on them. Okay, maybe being very protective or, su you know, really supervising or you know, wants to be part of what's going on. He was interrupting a lot. All right. So here's where everything takes a turn. Sometime between 9 and 11 p.m., Michael prepares drinks for the girls. Smoothies, mango smoothies. Okay. But not all the girls wanted a mango smoothie. He was very insistent that the girls drink their mango smoothies. Some of the girls complained. They said that there were things, hard things floating in it, like one could describe it possibly as pieces of, um, you know, a pill that wasn't well chopped up, or it also could have been, you know, the, the protein powder sticking. I, we don't know. Um, here's the other thing that's really bizarre. Each girl was given her own smoothie with a different colored straw. So he was very insistent that each girl keep to their own smoothie. Why would you care who drinks what? Unless, of yeah. course, one has more than the other for nefarious reasons. Right. Wow. D right? That's it's yeah. a little weird, a little controlling. But okay. Mm -hmm. So so now they go ahead and they start drinking the smoothies. And one girl didn't like the taste of it and didn't want to drink it. And he insisted. So according to the girl, this is what they told police, Michael, the dad goes, makes another smoothie for this girl, gives it to her again. She has a little of it, but she doesn't have enough, not like the rest of the girls. And whether he knew or not that she had enough to drink, I think uh, this is just speculation, but my guess is, because this is the clever one, she she's the one who didn't like it. So she was the least sedated and she also pretended to be asleep when he came down to check on the girls. So creepy. Wow. All right. Wow. So let's get to the even creepier part here. So according to the girls, um, two of the girls were sharing a pullout couch in the basement while the other two slept in an adjacent bedroom in the basement. So two girls and two girls. Um... Now, the girls have described that they felt very sleepy, like a very deep, deep sleep. And as we described, when they were woken up and up until noon of the next day, 12 hours later plus, one of the girls at least had to be assisted by her parents and doctors just to walk and oh couldn't keep her eyes open. That is some heavy sedation. Very scary. All right. So now we are going to hear what happened in that basement, according to the one girl who had the least of the drug that was allegedly used. 
Okay, so she says that Michael kept coming downstairs to the basement. And then at one point, she was cuddled with one of the other girls and had her arm around her friend and they were sleeping on the pullout couch. And that she pretended to be asleep when Michael came down. And that she says Michael took her arm off of the, that she had on the other girl who was sound asleep, drugged, I would say, at least that's what police say, removed the girl. And then he also moved that unconscious girl down to the edge of the bed. So the girl who was still awake, but pretending to be asleep, she then pulled her unconscious friend back in, you know, back into a cuddle. Mm -hmm. Because she was afraid that Michael was planning something. What do you make of this, Judy? Oh my gosh. I mean, clearly the alarm bells were going off for this this more uh, alert teen. And what, what would he be doing to try to come down, to try to make sure that they were really asleep multiple times? And then also why separate the girls if he wasn't intending something nefarious? What's the point? I mean, I get it. Maybe as a parent hosting a sleepover, you might check on you know the kids at one point. Okay, they're sleeping, close the door. Why would he come in and do such a concerted effort of checking to see if they were breathing normally, if they could be roused at any point, and then separating two girls so that there would be physical space in between them. I mean, clearly there was an intention here, and this is so terrible that he was doing this not only to the girlfriends of her his daughter, but also he, he drugged his own daughter. I mean, his own daughter had the same substances in her smoothie. So, I mean, what was he thinking about doing with that? I don't know. I mean, did you... Again, you know, his attorney has said that there, he hasn't seen the evidence against his client. His client is presumed innocent and, uh-huh. you know, he is just charged. Now, mm-hmm. think about it. You don't, uh, why would he drug his child? I don't know. One possibility is you have to have all the children out in order to accomplish what you're going to accomplish if it's something horrible, right? You can't right. leave one awake because no. then there will be someone as a witness. So... Right. And beyond that, it could have been horrible for all of them. It may not just be about leaving witnesses. It may be about harming all of them. We don't know. Again, charged here, charged and says he's innocent. So let's get back to all the other visits. We are told by that little girl, the 12-year-old who managed to stay awake but pretend to be asleep, that he was waving hands in front of faces to see if there was a reaction, putting his hand under noses to see, you know, were they breathing I should hope that they're breathing. I should hope that they're breathing. It would not, I mean, that would be horrible. And I don't know if he was doing that just to make sure that he hadn't allegedly put too much in the way of sedatives. So this one girl who is awake and pretending to be asleep, she reached out to her family for help. At 1.43, she texted her mom, quote, mom, please pick me up and say I have a family emergency. I don't feel safe. I might not respond, but please come get me. Puts in a crying emoji. Please, please pick me up. Please, please. How scary is that? How scary is that? So apparently she wasn't able to reach her parents. So she knew that there was another adult that she could reach out to. That That adult responded to her and went to pick her up and, and, um, This time, uh, what is so strange is that Michael is like taken back and and doesn't want to let this, you know, adult take the girl. He's actually arguing, arguing with them. So when um, and the woman who came to pick her up said, you know, Michael seemed to be slurring his words. Um, it was all very strange. And then mm. when that girl gets out of there, they contact all the other parents and and are able to now tell them, you better get your kid right away. So it's something like three in the morning now and the other parents show up and now mm. Michael is arguing. He's arguing with them and said, they're sleeping. Leave them alone. Don't pick them up. Come back in the morning. Oh, what parent would always say to another parent, no, you can't have your child there sleeping. Come back in the morning. How ridiculous is that? Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, these are the kids of their parents. Like, 
these are their kids. They can do yeah. whatever they want, right? Absolutely. Why would you even try to talk them out of getting their children? I mean, that's just that's just sick. And also, of course, super concerning that he was slurring his words. Gosh knows what other drugs he might have been on. It's possible that he wasn't just drunk. Maybe he himself was taking some sedatives too, you know? So uh, who knows? I mean, there's who so knows? much here. Who knows? So, so much these, here. Right? So these parents go down in the basement. They're trying to wake the girls. The girls are not waking. You know, it's they need help getting up. So all the parents, meaning of the three sleepover girls, take the girls to the hospital. They're like, there is something very wrong here. They go to the hospital, and according to authorities, the three 12-year-old girls tested positive for benzodiazepines. What are those, Judy? So benzodiazepines, first of all, it's a it's a controlled substance. So you have to have a valid prescription for it, and they're very habit-forming and can be very addictive for many individuals. Benzodiazepines are a type of central nervous depressant. And so, especially when they're mixed with alcohol, which is also another central nervous depressant, it can have some really harmful effects. But essentially, benzodiazepines can produce sedation and even symptoms of hypnosis. Um, it's usually helped to relieve very severe anxiety, but because they are habit forming, they're usually only prescribed as needed and never for a long period of time. Um, the most common benzodiazepines that are prescription drugs that you might have heard of are Valium, Xanax, Ativan, and Clonopin. Those are some of the more uh, common ones that people may have heard of. But these, they're, they're very, very, very um, harmful over time for many people. And especially when somebody has, for example, an addiction history in their family, doctors tend to be super careful about prescribing these, if at all. And they could also be sleeping pills. Are ben are these benzos also in the sleeping pill family? Yes, exactly. So sometimes people do use them to try to go to sleep. But again, people have complained that when they use it too much, they're very, very hard to rouse in the morning. They feel super groggy. It affects their cognitive functioning. Essentially, what the benzodiazepines do is it tells your brain to release a specific neurotransmitter called GABA. So GABA is an inhibitory transmitter, which means that it slows every one of your functions down. So it makes your nervous system less active, which not only does it make you super sleepy, but it makes it hard for you to, for example, fight back or to have more fight or flight reactions. Um, this is why it's so scary and why if you're taking too many benzodiazepines, um, you can actually be groggy sometimes for a couple of days. There have been people who have overdosed on a benzodiazepine, maybe thinking, well, I'll just take two tonight instead of one. So I'm really having a hard time sleeping. And then they'll sleep for almost two days, you know, because they can't wake up at the usual time. And so I, who knows what kind of dose he put in these girls' smoothies? You know, the whole different colored uh, Straw. straws to me means that he was trying to see which of them might be the most out of it. I just think that it's a very, very dangerous drug to be messing with. And people definitely have some really severe side effects when they overdose on them. They're 12 years old. I mean, I don't know what exactly. a 12 year old weighs, but they're surely under most of the time under 100 pounds. They're right. Do you know what I'm saying? These are tiny people. So I know. and these are a, a, a adult drugs. And again, he says he's innocent and he's innocent until proven guilty. But according mm -hmm. to the police and according to the hospital, you have three children who slept at that house who absolutely have these sedatives in their system based on all of the drug testing. So Right. That... And overdose can lead to deadly results, by the way. Anna, people have fell on into comas, have died from overdose of benzodiazepine. At high doses, it can stop your breathing and stop oxygen from reaching your brain, which is how sometimes people die from an overdose. And so... He's obviously, he obviously doesn't care about what happens, not even to his own daughter, which is what's crazy to me, that he even drugged his own daughter. <sighs> this whole thing is so scary. Again, a parent's worst right. nightmare. So after the right. test results came back positive, the mm -hmm. hospital calls the police and the police arrive at about 7 a.m. And like I mentioned, by noon, still 12 hours later, the police are observing at least one of the girls who cannot stand or walk on her own. She's being held up by her parents and hospital staff, can't even open her eyes. 
It's 12 hours later and she's still heavily sedated in a hospital. Right. right. So you can tell that there were ob- was obviously a huge amount. And by the way, um, you know, sometimes people talk about the date rape drug Rufi. Rufi mm-hmm. is in the class of benzodiazepines. And so they're, they have this potential to be used in sexual assault because, again, it makes it harder for you to react. It relaxes all your muscles to the point where you can't fight back and you don't even know what's happening to you. Oh, so frightening. So frightening. So police say they quickly zeroed in on the dad, Michael, as a suspect. (sighs) Again, the only one who would have been home with the girls. So that was August, as we said. And then a grand jury indicted Michael in early 2024 on three counts each of causing another to ingest a controlled substance, application of a Schedule IV controlled substance to another, and delivery of a controlled substance to a minor. Now, it's very possible that he may be charged with more. We really don't know. Those are the initial charges and in the indictment from a grand jury. Following the grand jury indictment, Michael Midden um, willingly turned himself in on February 27th. The following day, he pleaded not guilty to the charges and his bail was set at $50,000. So just a little insight into what's going on. Two months um, after the incident, Remember, the incident was in August, but he wasn't charged until this year. Apparently, he and his wife of 16 years finally divorced, whether they filed for divorce or it went. I mean, it it became formal. Mm -hmm. So something was going on there. Um, Apparently, he is now not living in that million dollar home, but is living in an RV park in Vancouver. In his defense, Michael's lawyer has claimed that he hasn't seen any of the evidence in these alleged crimes and said, quote, Mr. Maiden is presumed innocent and we hope that people will reserve judgment until all the facts and circumstances are known. Mm -hmm. We will follow this case. Um, I think all of us as parents, there's certainly, we can all learn a lesson from this. Absolutely, that little girl knew something was wrong. She knew something was wrong, and she called for help right away. I don't know what else. Thank goodness for that little girl. Right? Thank goodness for that little girl. I mean, and I'm trying to think what else she could have done. I mean, I I think the other thing is to try and run away. Run away, scream, get help, right? Yeah. And get help. Run out the right. front door screaming. Now, I don't know how many houses were around, but I don't know what the oh other gosh. alternative the child would have had. I, I don't know, but uh, dial it's number amazing. One, nine, she could have dialed 911 too. Of course. But, you know, what amazing problem solving abilities of this child to react in such a scary situation um, to, to be able to have the wherewithal to say this doesn't feel right to like want to protect her friend by like grabbing her back into the cuddle and like pretending to be asleep herself so that the dad wouldn't be uh, noticing that she might be concocting a plan to save all of them. Um, So, I mean, it's just so amazing that she was able to do that at 12 years old. Like what wonderful judgment and, and ability to react in an emergency situation. The takeaway here for all of us is she absolutely did the right thing. The only other options, if you're having discussions with your children, right, would be right. to dial 911 if you can't reach your parents, which, you know, that does happen on a sleepover. I mean, they could have, right? Parents are sleeping right. during, call 911, run out the door screaming like a banshee. Oh my gosh. The only exactly. other option. I mean, I have an adult son and I, I swear swear to you to this day, I will say to him, and I, it's been, you know, on his brain, but he's an adult, a, adult young man. I'm like, Never, ever leave your drink anywhere at a bar unattended. You either take it with you or you dump it. You know, you never, exactly. ever leave anything unattended. You know, never. whether you're the parent of an adult, young man, young woman, you always want them to always, always, always be worried about the people around you. Exactly. Exactly. So hopefully we're helping to get some information out there and uh, helping parents to educate their children. You know, it's never too early to talk about these issues that could endanger a child, right? So 
on a, my, uh, my son is a little bit over two years old and I've already been educating him for the last few months about like good touch and bad touch and like who can touch you there and why. I mean, he's two, but he knows a lot. They comprehend so much at this age. And um, I'm already starting that educational process because when there's a predator, they know when to strike and they strike on the most vulnerable. And oftentimes it's younger children, children who might not be well supervised, right? There's a lot of different reasons for why a predator might strike. And so just because of what I do and you know what you do also, I mean, we're just exposed to this so much and we just can't trust in the inherent goodness of every single person. Are most people good? Yes. But are there bad players? Yes. And so as a parent, I think you just have to, even though it's like such a scary process to even think about this potentially happening to your child, but giving them these lessons early on so they can do something about it when they recognize the situation that they're in is so, so, so crucial. Thank you, Judy. Did you know that according to FBI property crime data, most home break-ins happen in broad daylight? As the days get longer this spring, protect your home with Simply Safe. I know when it's lighter longer, I tend to be out more and just really enjoy the day. And it's always reassuring to have Simply Safe protecting your home whether you're there or not. Both experts and customers love Simply Safe for its comprehensive protection. It was named Best Home Security Systems of 2024 by US News and World Report and recognized for the best customer service in home security by Newsweek. Its advanced technology protects every room, window, and door of your home while cameras keep watch for suspicious activity 24-7. You can install the system yourself, or if you prefer, get a professional to do it for you. One thing I love about Simply Safe is that you can test it out with no risk. So if you aren't sure, you can see how you like it. There is a 60-day risk-free trial. So if you don't love the system, you can return it for a full refund. Protect your home today. Our listeners get a special 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash true crime. That's simplysafe.com slash true crime. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Our next case broke in New York while I was there. And when I saw this on the news, I said, oh my God, we have got to talk about this on the podcast. Because how crazy is this that someone who is part of the criminal justice system as far as advocating for people and working with troubled teens is himself now charged with murder and, you know, dismembering a body? Like those two things together were like, what? You know, it's like one one among us, you could say. It's very frightening. Now, he's a little unusual in the sense he is a convicted felon, had a criminal history, and, and his whole being recently since being released was all about reform and support. Um, but nonetheless, I'm, and this is a guy who like, there are photos of him out there with the DA, pictures with the DA. He was even on... Um, Joe Rogan's podcast talking about reform. Okay. So oh this is a guy who had a voice, a voice to discuss criminal justice, the criminal justice system you would have considered was kind of like an insider, someone who to a degree was respected and now is himself charged with murder. Insane. <laughs> Just just right. just crazy making. All right. So based on on this arrest, it appears that Sheldon Johnson is not the reformed criminal that he professed to be. Mm. Sheldon Johnson, who is 48 years old, has pleaded not guilty to the murder of another man, a man he may have served prison with. This man, the victim, is Colin Small, and he was 44 at the time that he was murdered. The two of them apparently knew each other from Sing Sing. I can't even believe that people still call that prison Sing Sing. Like, I feel like we're in a 1940s movie when I say Sing Sing. <laughs> it's the whole thing. Right. Is, it's so New York. Right. It's so New right. York. Okay. So police say that Sheldon, our reformer here, was discovered with Colin's headless torso and they say that then they found the victim's head and legs in a freezer in Sheldon's apartment. So apparently the victim here was chopped up and was in two apartments, the residence of the victim 
and Sheldon's residence, according to authorities. Okay, so here's the background. Here's the background. Mm -hmm. Sheldon says he was once a member of the Bloods gang, that he served 25 years in prison for attempted murder and robbery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sheldon claims that he used a gun to rob some drug dealers who allegedly owed him some money. And since his 1999 conviction, Sheldon was working to turn his life around. Um, He left the gang. He got his GED while he was in prison. Okay, these are all good things, all positive. And that, um, you know, that he was working as a counselor for at-risk teens and young people in the Queens Public Defender's Office at the time of this incident. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So some impressive things there. Okay. Now, the other thing is that at the time of that robbery, he also had a previous conviction for a weapons charge along with other offenses in New York and Pennsylvania. So the guy had quite a rap sheet. He finally is released from prison in May of 2023. It isn't even May of 2024 yet. It isn't even a year yet. Oh my gosh. So this reform... This reform did not really work Didn't last work out. that long. Right. <laughs> it does not appear that it worked very well here. Okay. So in February of this year, that would be last month, Sheldon appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast, which you know is very popular, one of the most popular mm-hmm. podcasts. And he shared his inspirational story about turning his life around. Wow. Okay. Wow. And Sheldon said in the podcast, he had to make some conscious decisions to walk away from his previous life in order to improve himself. Here is a segment from that podcast. Listen for yourself. It was at that moment where I I really said, I have to change my life. I have to change my life. I I, I just can't do this. Um, I had a wife, I had family still. My son was growing up. he was hearing stories about my so-called uh, notoriety, and um, I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to be that dad. Like I really was looking at myself and really evaluating, and asking myself, like, "Yo, what the fuck are you doing?" I was still. I was smoking a lot of weed at the time. I was drinking um, jailhouse hooch, um, and I was at my worst. And I, and I had to real, I had to figure out how to get to my best. All right, Judy. So here's the thing. Sheldon's talking about how he had to do something. And then he also said, very matter of factly, that if right. all else fails, quote, I could always go back to doing something bad. Wow. Well, that was a true prediction if there ever was one. So what do you make of that? Because I know, you know, you deal with criminals. So if you have a criminal here who has a, you know, clearly a convicted criminal, a a man with a long history of crime, he's in this unique golden period where he appears, at least publicly, to be turning things around. But he says if all else fails, he could go back to doing something bad. How do you interpret those words? Well, you know, there's a couple of things about this case that that make me think, you know, they, they essentially gave him a much longer, sounds like a much more severe sentence than they might have given the weight of his actual uh, actual crimes. And who knows, you know, who were the decision makers there and why they did what they did. But sometimes we see a heavier sentencing when you think that this person may not actually be able to be a productive citizen if they were released early. Um, of course, he did have a rap sheet. That's another reason. But oftentimes when we think about mitigating factors, they do consider things like, is this person likely to be reformed? So it's possible that in the past, somebody caught on to some warning signs that maybe this was not going to be one that is going to be easily reformed after he was released. And it, with regards to that statement of, well, if this doesn't work, I can always go back to doing something bad. To me, I feel like if you're really on this path of reform and you really have this conviction that you're going to be a changed man, why would you even surmise about that other option, right? So perhaps he knew himself better than anyone is actually giving him credit for. There was a part of him that knows, you know what? There's still that dark part of me. Maybe he was having this internal fight every day of 
yes, I want to be a good person, but I don't know how to do it. Or I just have this urge, this drive to keep doing crime, right? And to me now, of course, we're doing the whole Monday night quarterbacking and we can say, well, hindsight is 2020. But now looking at this in hindsight, it's like he was warning everybody that maybe he wasn't going to be able to carry through with this new version of himself. It's possible, right? It's very possible. Right. Now, the thing is, police still have not told us what the motive was or what happened between these two people, because, um, again, it, it's it's very confusing. Like, what would cause someone who he, the victim was, like, supposedly shot and then chopped up? So right. there are a lot of ways to deal with a dispute. You don't have to kill someone if you're having a disagreement with them. And my my guess is, you know, if you're from that world, you have a shorthand on how you say to someone, yeah, I think you're going a, a step too far there. I'd, I'd, I'd back off. And most people probably hear you. So uh, I don't know. We, we just don't have those details yet. OK, so police say that Sheldon and the victim, Colin Small, were both incarcerated at Sing Sing Prison about the same time, and according to the New York Post, the men may have even shared an alias together. They both use the name Timothy Gibbs in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Now, I don't understand, I mean, I don't know, was that like a common alias? I have no idea. <laughs> it's a little weird. That's interesting, why, yeah. Right, it's, it's definitely a little weird. So clearly they knew each other and had history way before being out. Colin Small had a rap sheet of his own for multiple drug-related drug arrests and robberies. Um, he was released on parole in 2017 after he was himself jailed on a murder charge back from 2006. Okay, so we wow. have two clearly convicted criminals, felons here, who know each other, and they know each other on the outside. Now, here's the thing, that the victim in this case has been out since 2017, and the accused here, the so-called reformer, has not even been out a year. Okay, so that's just for a little perspective on what's going on here. Now let's get to the evidence, because honestly, this to me is fascinating. Colin was last seen on surveillance footage at around 10 p.m. on March 4th, entering his Bronx apartment. So that's the last time that the victim was seen alive. In the early morning hours of the next day, March 5th, Colin's neighbors say that they heard gunshots from the sixth floor and that they contacted police and the witnesses claim that they heard two gunshots followed by the sound of what sounded like a man pleading for his life saying, please don't, I have a family. According to the witnesses, two more shots followed that silence. Okay, here's the part that in all of this is very fuzzy for me. Depending mm. on some of the reports here, apparently police did some kind of a check but it didn't lead anywhere. So I don't know if the check was like a knock on the door, nobody's responding, we have no reason to believe anything and can't break it. I, I, it's not clear to me. I wish I could clarify it for everyone. This is the fuzzy part for me. Okay, now here's what continues, is that neighbors see a, a man going in and out of the apartment who is not the victim. It, according to the witnesses, it was Sheldon, the reformer, except each time he's going in and out of the apartment, and this is based on the video surveillance, he's wearing different hats. Wow. He's wearing a, a women's blonde wig. He's carrying cleaning supplies. He has um, one of those big plastic tubs, you know, the kind you get at the hardware store, Costco, those big storage things. So all of this footage is very, very clear. And when the superintendent of the building sees all this, He's like, there's something really weird going on. Why would the same man visit the apartment in and out wearing things that clearly identify him and do not disguise him? Like, wow. Yeah. Like how you call more attention to yourself if, you know, if if you're a man of color with a shocking blonde wig, a woman's wig, all the I mean, he just looks like himself with a blonde wig and he, he, he doesn't look right. It's not like you think he's anybody else. Right. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, it's like not even an effort to try to hide. I mean, that. I, no, no. I mean, no, you, you really none. do. 
you really do stand out. Um, and then the other hat he has, like some people have described it, I guess, as a golfing hat. I think it's one of those like hunting caps, you know, that come all the way down. You'll all be seeing the pictures of him, those of you who are listening. So again, you know, if he was disguising himself, frankly, I think he called more attention to himself with the choices he made as he went in and out of the apartments. So the superintendent calls 911 asking for a welfare check. Okay, when the authorities knock on the door of the victim, right? Knocks on the door. Who opens the door? Police say it's Sheldon, the police reformer. Okay. So now police are kind of worried and they go and they get a search warrant. And when they come back, they realize now they have other evidence. They have the headless human torso, which clearly belongs to Colin Small, according to authorities. Sheldon, mm -hmm the reformer is taken into custody and then they get a search warrant for Sheldon's Harlem apartment. And in that apartment on March 6th, police say they found the rest of the body parts, the rest of Colin. They say they found oh, wow. in Sheldon's freezer, a set of human legs, an arm, and a decapitated head, a head with a gunshot wound. Oh. That is a hell of a mess. Oh my gosh. And I mean, just the, just the level of work that it takes to not only shoot this person in cold blood, but then to actually go through the rest of it, you know, dismembering, chopping this body up. I mean, I, it's really hard to imagine how much of this was essentially just, you know, taking over this person's life. Sheldon's life was basically just colored by this particular crime. It was like, bits and pieces, literally, and spending so much time um, not only shooting this person in cold blood, but then, you know, even treating the body with such disrespect. And you have to wonder, you know, why? Why go to that length? Look, if, if he indeed, as the police say, that Sheldon had body parts of Colin in his own freezer, right. I mean, like, well, how'd they get there? You know? Like right. what right. is your, is, how is this the disposal of a crime scene? Exactly. How is this the cleanup of a crime scene? I, I, I don't know what happened no. between the two. I really don't. No. I don't know no. what he was thinking. I mean, going, he clearly went back to, according to police and according right. to the surveillance video, he went back to the scene of the crime multiple times in really poor disguises. And then the victim's body parts and head are in you know the suspect's home it's just i don't and then when you see the video of um sheldon coming out is so interesting he's like literally covered from head to toe with one of those white hazmat things you know and the for those of you who are listening so you know, they have hoods and it looks like it's tightly tied all the way around his face as he's being brought out. And you could see, you know, the bits of his face, a little bit of his face, and then his glasses under all of this. So I'm watching this whole thing and it's just tells such a radically different story from the guy who was on Joe Rogan's podcast. Right. I mean, again, this he was the, the face of, you know, let's give criminals a chance, right? He was semi-famous a little bit in his own right. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to have such a terrible fall. I mean, this is not, oh man, you know, I, you know, I, I try to steal again. I mean, it's not something mild. This is murdering somebody, going through the lanes to carry parts of his body to different places, including your own home. I mean, this is so awful and grotesque. And at some point, you would think that somebody who was trying to start a new life would say, you know what, this is enough. Like I, you know, I must stop now. This is this is going way more uh, and becoming way more severe than I ever intended it to be. But I mean, just you gotta think about there's so many decision points where maybe he could have stopped, you know, after one part of the crime, but it just became worse and worse and worse as time went on. And for those people who are skeptical of reform, this is quite I know, an example. That sucks. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, there are some people who do reform. And I think this is going to give people pause and contribute to that stigma that, you know what, like, 
we should just all just lock them up all for life, you know, or, or, or worse yet, well, maybe the death penalty really should be exercised more often. You know, you can just imagine why people would think that of after course. something like this. Absolutely. Yes. So on March 7th, Sheldon was charged with murder, manslaughter, weapon possession, concealment of a human corpse, and criminal contempt. He's pleaded not guilty to all the charges. Sheldon will be back in court in early April. He is currently being held without bail. It is time for our comment section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media. And here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. Great to have you back. Great to see you. Great to see you. <laughs> Judy, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. I'm very excited to hear what you have for us today. <laughs> okay. I always look forward to this. All right. This is... I must say, I must interrupt because yeah. someone wrote on YouTube like a week or two ago said, why doesn't anyone ever ask Will how he is? during this segment and so will i think that's a very valid point how are you will oh i'm great i'm so excited for spring to be here i know everybody kind of complains about moving the <laughs> clocks forward but like i love it being light out past 5 p.m i'm so i'm i'm very happy i'm in a great mood i'm i yeah i'm spring is here i feel i feel like a new man um, anyways, our case this week, I'm calling a deep fried crime syndicate. Uh, this comes out of Tucson, Arizona, where according to police, three fast food workers uh, have been arrested as part of a theft ring, which was operated out of a fried chicken restaurant that they worked at. Now, just off the top, they have not named this, uh, th the actual name of this chicken restaurant anywhere that I could find. So I'm so sorry, I don't have a name for you. I don't know if it's Chick-fil-A, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, but authorities reportedly started investigating over a year ago. So long investigation here. Uh, but this all kind of came about uh, after a, a shoplifting case, which kind of uncovered a, an alleged syndicate that was trafficking in this stolen property. So detectives began monitoring this restaurant and they discovered that these employees had been paying shoplifters for items that were lifted from local businesses in the surrounding area. Now, it's unclear if the shoplifters are coming to them and then they're buying these goods from them, or if they're like contracting these shoplifters to go out and be like, hey, you know, go get this, I'll give you X right. money. Targeted, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So that part is kind of unclear, but this investigation got like so massive and complex that agents from ho the Homeland Security investigations joined local police to continue surveillance to, to kind of break apart this whole alleged scheme. Now, through the course of surveillance, police claim the suspects were operating an online marketplace where they were selling these stolen goods and also allegedly selling them from their residences in person. Now, in addition to how they were selling this stuff, police have also said that the goods were stored at two additional addresses, which have not been made public, but Possibly one of the addresses could include this actual restaurant itself. The chicken uh, place. This yeah. is where I'm confused. Like, what does this have to do with chicken? Well, they all worked there, right? They all okay, worked okay. at this place. Uh, okay. And then, yeah, maybe some of this stolen goods stuff has uh, has was stored there or you know, it, it might have been, you know, sold out of there as well. They haven't released all the details because this is reportedly like it's still an ongoing investigation. The theft ring they think could be larger, so there could be more arrests forthcoming. So like none of these suspects, which I'll just name right now, uh, they arrested uh, Lydia Gravala Velasquez, who is 52 years old, 61 year old Fabian Rodriguez Rios and 45 year old Francis Sofia Vasquez. Now, None of them have a court date, but they've all been charged uh, and booked with uh, trafficking stolen property. So there, there could be, like, like I said, there could be more arrests. It's really, it, it seems like they haven't completely uncovered the whole thing yet. Now, I'm sure people are probably wondering, like, what exactly were they selling? Like, what were these stolen goods? And to be honest with you, it ran the gamut. It was so much stuff. So there's kind of the usual things that you would expect, you know, clothing, shoes, electronics, that kind of stuff. And then there's even other stuff like tools and even things like diapers, police say. So oh, like, diapers are very expensive. Well, I know, but you would, I, I, don't, I guess, I don't know. I feel like A, they're bulky, seems kind of hard to move and steal and sell. I, I don't really know. Um, wow. But it, it, it's just, it's just so much stuff. You know, I guess when I think of, like shoplifting theft, I think of, you know, retail, I think of, you know, bags, shoes, you know, you're kind of uh -huh. high ticket items, but uh, this is, yeah, kind of everything. Um, but as I said, there, you know, the, the investigation is ongoing. None of these suspects have a court date. I'll update you uh, if if we get anything, um, but yeah, just wow. just a very bizarre 
just a very bizarre case. The other thing that kind of struck me is like all of these suspects are in their, you know, mid 40s, 50s, 60s. When I initially read the headline, I was like, oh, employees at a fast food restaurant, theft ring. You know, I'm thinking younger people. I'm thinking teens, early 20s. You know, it kind of seems like what, you know, you would allegedly what I would allegedly think would be a theft ring. I think of, you know, the bling ring or something like that, not much older suspects, I guess. Wow. Oh, you know, let's not have some ageism here. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not saying they're old. All I'm just ages saying... do crime. <laughs> I'm saying they should know better. They should they know should better. They should know better. You wish. Yeah, I mean, that would be, that would seem to be the order of life. But how many times have we known people to, I mean, who knows, right? Not an excuse, but having a midlife crisis, a late life crisis, and doing things that are completely inexplicable. Uh, but it sounds like they were really trying to be a one stop shop. Like, you can come get your high level merchandise here, your designer bags, but you can also get some diapers. Because yeah. that's important. Yeah, you got to yeah. really cover your bases. So I guess maybe yeah. the um, the the foresight does does take an, a, a a more mature age to to be able to have that yeah. sort of foresight to, to really. The fact that you would think it. about diapers that seems like a an older yeah. person decision. Like, hey, you know Definitely. what? We we've lived life long enough now that we know there are families who need diapers. Yeah, okay. yeah, you yeah. you've been there. You're like this. This is expensive. I think right. there's some value to this. Um, right. But we got a lot of comments on this one. Sammy G uh, can't, had to come in with the Breaking Bad reference. They said Los Pollos Hermanos, which if you're unfamiliar with the show, there's a very popular uh, fried chicken restaurant in the show that's a front for uh, a meth dealing. But they also coincidentally just have really good fried chicken that people think is in the show. They think is like as good or better than KFC. Um, <laughs> right. I, I, I like the reference. We Last last time I was on, we had a, another Breaking Bad reference. So I, I'm continuing the theme here. Um, Ali M commented on these mugshots. They said it looks like a hilarious Hilarious crime, Rob. Excellent casting. Um, I I could maybe watch a movie adaptation of this. It, it, it depends on how deep this whole thing goes. Um, <laughs> Rollo R uh, thought this this story was going in a much more uh, troubling direction uh, when they saw the deep fried uh, syndicate title. They said uh, the title had me thinking they were in there cooking people and serving them to customers, which. I try oh. to stay away. I try to stay away from anything, wow. uh, anything oh, that dark. dark. Yeah, yes, yeah. That's, I, that's super dark. I'm not trying to get into no. a Sweeney Todd situation on this, no. this segment. Um, <laughs> right, right. No, this segment is supposed to make us laugh and, and yes. be more lighthearted. lighthearted. If it was that story, that would have been in Anna's primary story. That's that's right. Right. I, 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 leave, I leave that to you too. I leave oh that to God. the experts, okay? Um, I just oh want to do gosh. my little fast food crime stories over here. Uh, Bronson great. T said, it's always chicken. I live near some poultry processing plants and there are massive thefts, which I, I, I mean, I haven't investigated this. I have no idea if there's a link between chicken and crime. I, I, I really couldn't wow. tell you. I kind of um, think so. Remember those Tyson executives who got into it in like oh a parking my gosh. lot? And then yeah. all the frozen chicken that oh, was stolen no. on another case. It's always chicken. It's yeah. chicken or it's, it's my favorite place, the um, the Waffle House. I mean, it seems to be the oh, two man. top places where yeah. or or the whole thing with the sauce going through like a McDonald's. There's like always oh, somebody flips out if they don't get their fries yeah. and their sauce. It's just I. They lose, people lose their minds. Wow. They lose their minds. We got to end this one on a pun, though. Allison R., who I just want to say, Allison R. generally always comments on these, uh, always comes through with something great. But they said, this definitely sounds like foul play. Keep us abreast of the situation. Thank you, Oh, Allison. good for Love you, it. Allison. Thank you, and Allison. Excellent. Um, <laughs> but that is going to do it for this week's comment section. Uh, as always, you can leave those comments over on our YouTube community page. Uh, you can also reach out to us anytime. We're on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Twitter uh, or X. X. Uh, I knew the, I was like waiting for I you know, to, to, I know. to all I the know. normal X. things. I'm trained to say one thing. And also like what? OK, if it's not Twitter, then what are the posts? If like the not, X's? If they're not tweets, they're X's? Yeah, they're X. I don't yeah. know. Doesn't, know. Really, doesn't, doesn't really roll sense. off the tongue for me. Doesn't really roll no, off the tongue No, it doesn't. Uh, but yes. anyways, that'll do it. Thank you so much. And I will see you all next week. So, Judy, uh, you have a new book coming out. I'm very excited about it. It's all about attachment. I'm fascinated by this. Yeah, thank you so much for shouting it out. So it's actually going to be out in less than two weeks. And I just got the actual book in the mail oh, wow. a little while ago. Very, very excited. But it's called The New Rules of Attachment and really pumped about it. 
basically, it's all about how these early experiences, oftentimes we think of as, okay, you know, early bonding experiences with our parents, family members, that was so long ago, but yet we're always affected by them. And sometimes we're affected not only in our romantic relationships, which is what attachment is mostly discussed is about romantic relationships, but actually it affects everything. It affects what you think about yourself, your self-concept, whether or not you can be productive at work, whether or not you really drive towards goals in your career, whether or not you think you deserve good outcomes, and also affects all of your other relationships, collegial friendships and family relationships. And so it's all about how to heal from your attachment wounds, no matter what age you are and what stage you are in life. And even if the people who might have had a hand in creating perhaps an insecure attachment style in yourself um, aren't available to do the work with you. The, the goal is you don't really need anyone except for yourself to be able to do the work and start the healing process to live the life that you want. It's so interesting when you say, you know, it falls on you and, and um, yeah. how many times it's been explained to me that, you know, even though you want to either you know, have it out, meaning have it all the discussion out with the person who harmed you and that you need yeah. them to understand and how you feel that you can't move forward or have your closure until the other person either hears you, sees you or buys in. But really, right. you can't control that end of it. All you can control is your partner. I, I think that that for me is a constant struggle that I have to fix this on my own whether the other person who hurt me or wronged me or abandoned me accepts mm -hmm. it or is part of the healing. Like I want them to be part of my healing, but right. I guess we can't always yeah. do it that way, right? Yeah, sometimes they are and sometimes they're up for it and other times they're not, but don't throw up your hands and say, then there's no way that I can get better from this or don't just stay angry at the person thinking that that's gonna manifest something. You know, Anger, when you hold on to it, chronic anger only hurts yourself physically and mentally. And so this is all about empowerment, taking it back into your own hands and saying, hey, you know what? I'm a different person now and I can reparent myself. I can give my inner child what it needs to be able to be successful and to live the best life that I possibly can with the short time we all have on this earth. Does your book have, because uh, I, I was looking on Amazon um, at your book, and does your book have like uh, either worksheets or things like that? Because I was debating between oh, like, yeah. do I need the physical book? Because it said, well, available on Kindle, and I do a lot of audio books. And I'm like, gee, yeah. I'm wondering if that's going to really work for me oh, yeah. in this book. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if you get a if you get the Kindle version or the audiobook version, which I narrated, you will get a PDF with all of the exercises. So you'll still get everything. Oh, really? Yeah. How exciting. Judy yeah. can read to me. <laughs> I know. I know. I was so excited to be able to do this audiobook rendition. My first book, um, Harper Collins hired a professional narrator, which, you know, she was awesome. I met her in person. She was great. But there's nothing like being able to read your own writing. Yes. Um, and I actually got a lot of requests for that. I had a lot of people email me and say, why weren't you the one reading your own audiobook? So anyway, the good news is if you're somebody who likes to consume this information through audiobooks, you will get the PDF with all the exercises. And if you go to my website, you can get exercises now for free. So I always make free resources available on my website. So you can check it out there too. Oh, that's great. I'm so excited now because I was debating like, how am I going to do this? Because I, I want to follow along and do, um, because when over Christmas you did your advent calendar to help yeah. <laughs> with these exercises. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I know. I, I need a visual aid. I definitely need visual aid. I love audiobooks, but I always need something to look at too. So yeah, you'll definitely get those accompaniments no matter how you purchase the book. Oh, so great. So Judy, one more time, the title of the book and when is it out so people can title get it? The title of the book, yeah, it's called The New Rules of Attachment. It's coming out March 26th. You can pre-order it now. There's a 20% uh, incentive. Actually, you can go to my website for more details, but the uh, discount code is New Rules 20 on the Hachette uh, book website. But you can also, of course, buy it at Amazon, Target, and wherever books are sold. Yay. Yay. Congratulations. Thank um, you. How many books is this now, Judy? This is my third book, but my second solo author one. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Massive congratulations. And, you know, you are just such an awesome person and human. And I'm just, oh, I'm, you. I'm always, I'm always so much happier when you're on the podcast. You are a ray of oh. sunshine. Thank you, Anna. Love you always. So happy to be here. Thank you for all your support through the years. And yeah, for having me back. It's always great to talk to you and 
thank you again for the opportunity and just congratulations on you and your team's award. You guys totally deserve it. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, you can find this episode, all episodes of our podcast, wherever you get your podcast. We have a bunch of special ones as well that we did. We had one last week that was special on an unsolved case of oh, cool. the father of a politician and how wow. it made this politician here in California really go back and think about some of the decisions he's made as a politician when it comes to the criminal justice system and how wow. you view things sometimes in an academic perfect world. And then when you are the victim of the crime, you see the system in a totally different way. Yeah. 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 Really interesting podcast. Wow. And of course, you can always just subscribe to our YouTube channel where we have a vibrant community. Can't wait to hear, hear your comments this week. And then, of course, you can receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>